So this is a picture of me 30 years ago uh, with my two sisters, Liz and Susie. Susie's the one in the wheelchair and she's got profound learning disability. And in 2005, the UK government decided to pass the Disability Discrimination Act to protect people with learning disabilities and other disabilities. And you might wonder, why was it necessary to protect people with learning disabilities? Some people with learning disabilities live in very beautiful places, like this one, a very tranquil setting. It's Winterbourne View. And some of you will remember that journalists working undercover exposed that the staff working in this care home for people with learning disabilities were showing the opposite of care or kindness. They were using cruelty to control the residents with learning disabilities in this home. Well, the history of violations of human rights against people with learning disabilities is uh, unfortunately quite long and quite sensitive. This is a poster from the 1930s in Germany. It's a propaganda poster, and what it says is that the cost of maintaining a person with learning disabilities across their lifetime is 60,000 Reichmarks. So using this economic argument, Hitler, when he first came to power, in 1933, passed a law called the Sterilization Act. And this required doctors to report if they had any patients with learning disabilities and to send them for compulsory sterilization. During the Nazi regime, some 400,000 people with learning disabilities and other psychiatric conditions were compulsorily sterilized. And this was, of course, to stop them passing on their genes, so-called eugenics. Now, you may be surprised to know that eugenics, the belief in eugenics, was not specific to Germany in the early 30s. In the US, the land of the free, 33 different states passed laws for compulsory sterilization of people with learning disabilities and other psychiatric conditions. And indeed, 65,000 people, patients with disabilities and psychiatric conditions, were compulsorily sterilized. This is Alexander Bell. Some of you know he's famous because he invented the telephone. That was good. But he was also president of the Eugenics Society, the International Eugenics Society, uh, which met uh, in New York and which supported these sorts of policies. This is the Hartheim Centre, uh, which looks very nice. And indeed, it's in the grounds of a very beautiful castle, the Hartheim Castle, in Austria. In the late 1930s, doctors were required to send their patients with learning disabilities to centers like this for treatment. They didn't need parental consent. Indeed, they were obliged to do so. Turned out that there was no treatment and that people with learning disabilities were simply killed. The cause of death was recorded as pneumonia and under the Nazi regime, some 30,000 people with learning disabilities and other psychiatric conditions were killed in this center alone. So this was really the program called euthanasia. And it was legal because Hitler, by 1939, had passed the euthanasia law, which uh, legit legitimized killing of people with disabilities. The man who was in charge of the euthanasia program is shown here, Karl Brandt, who was Hitler's personal physician. You can also see his fellow doctor, famous, 
uh, Dr. Joseph Mengele, and he worked in the, uh, the Auschwitz concentration camp. He was performing medical experiments on the inmates in the concentration camp. And what had happened was a small, barely perceptual shift from legitimizing the killing of people with learning disabilities to the legitimate or the legalized killing of other groups in society that weren't genetically pure Aryan. Dr. Joseph Mengele had a particular research interest in his medical research in twins, so he would watch for pairs of twins coming into the camp and he would take them into his laboratory, give them a lethal injection, and then dissect them so that he could look at their internal organs. So we're presented here with two doctors, two educated people, trained to care for their patients, but who are turning into murderers in the name of medicine and in the name for medical research. After the war, Karl Brandt was um, brought to trial at the Nuremberg Trials in 1945, and he was sentenced to be hanged for crimes against humanity. When they put the hood over his head, he shouted, there is no shame in standing at this scaffold. I have served my country. So examples of cruelty of this kind raise a big question. How is it possible for human beings to treat a person as a mere object? Well, the standard explanation is in terms of evil. Personally, I don't find the concept of evil helpful because it's not scientific. Rather, I think the, the concept of empathy is more helpful because it is scientific. And I'm going to argue that a loss of empathy may help us understand cruelty. Empathy has two components, at least. Cognitive empathy is the ability to imagine other people's thoughts and feelings. It's the recognition element. Affective empathy is the drive to respond with an appropriate emotion to other people's thoughts and feelings. It's the response element. And I'm going to argue particularly that it's the loss of affective empathy that can lead to, uh, it's a necessary factor that can lead to cruelty. Empathy isn't all or none. There are individual differences in empathy which gives rise to the empathy bell curve. Most of us are in the middle of this empathy spectrum with average levels of empathy. Some people are above average, but I want to ask the question, what are the factors, either social or biological, that can lead an individual to have very low empathy, even zero degrees of empathy? Well, one social factor is in-group, out-group relations. In Rwanda, one ethnic group used propaganda to stereotype the other ethnic group, calling them cockroaches, even subhuman. And when you dehumanize the enemy, you lose your empathy for them. And that resulted in the horrific genocide that ensued. But in-group, out-group relations can't really explain individuals like Ted Bundy. He was a psychology student at the University of Washington, and he volunteered to help on a telephone helpline. Women would phone up in distress, and he earned their trust and arranged to meet them outside of the helpline. And during the 1970s, he went on to commit murder, rape, and mutilation of at least 30 different women. Eventually, the police caught up with him, and he was given the electric chair in 1989. Individuals like Ted Bundy must have good cognitive empathy, that's how they can deceive, so well, but must lack affective empathy because they have no care for their victims. The evidence that psychopaths like Ted Bundy lack affective empathy comes from an experiment that was conducted by James Blair at Broadmoor Hospital. 
He showed psychopaths and a control group three different types of images, threatening images, neutral images, and then images of people in distress. And what he found was that the psychopath group only showed reduced electrodermal responses, how much they sweat on the palms of their hand, to images of people in distress. So this was evidence that they lacked affective empathy. Psychopaths don't come out of the blue. Typically, they've had a history of delinquency in their teens. And John Bowlby, who worked at the Tavistock Clinic here in London, he studied delinquents who were teenagers and found that many of them had experienced childhood maltreatment or neglect. So he argued that the absence of the experience of care and loving parents is a risk factor for losing your empathy in teenage. But what we know is that uh, this can't be the whole story because not everyone who's had a bad childhood loses their empathy. A study by Avshalom Kaspi, again here in London at the Institute of Psychiatry, found that the likelihood of developing delinquency in your teens goes up if you've experienced severe maltreatment, but it goes up even higher if you're also carrying one version of the MAOA gene, here shown in red. So genes and environment, are interacting. But how much empathy we show ultimately is a function of the empathy circuit in the brain. It's a network of regions that we use when we empathize. This is Phineas Gage, and he suffered a horrific accident in the 1840s in the States where he got damage to his ventromedial prefrontal cortex, part of the frontal lobe, he was working on the railroad and the dynamite went off a little bit too early and blew this metal rod up behind his eye and through his brain. Before the accident, he was described as very sensitive, very polite. After the accident, he was described as very rude and lacking in social judgment, unable to judge what was appropriate for different social situations. He'd lost his cognitive empathy. And Jean de Sassy is a neuroscientist in the University of Chicago, and he used fMRI, brain scanning, to look at which parts of the brain are active when teenagers with delinquency are watching short movie clips where somebody gets hurt. For example, where the lid of the piano falls down and crushes this man's fingers. What he found was that teenagers with delinquency showed uh, that didn't show the normal levels of activity in the amygdala, another part of the empathy circuit in the brain. But we've talked a bit about people with low empathy. What about people who have above average levels of empathy? These two men formed a relationship based on empathy and mutual respect and it led to the end of apartheid in South Africa. So we can think of empathy as being one of the most valuable natural human resources, that it has the power to end conflict. This man, Raoul Wallenberg, was a Swedish diplomat working in Budapest in 1944. He could see the Germans rounding up the Jews to take them to the train that would lead to the concentration camp. So he decided to use his influence as a Swedish diplomat to fake Swedish passports, and then he jumped up onto the roof of the train and pushed the fake Swedish passports in to, through the windows. He then jumped down and told the Nazi guards who were on the platform of the station that there were Swedish citizens on the train who should be released. He went one step further and rented dozens of buildings around Budapest, putting the Swedish flag outside of them and calling them things like the Swedish Cultural Center or the Swedish Research Institute, but where he hid Jews. And it's estimated 
that he saved over 100,000 Hungarian Jews from the gas chambers. So another example of the value of empathy as a natural human resource is that it can spur you into action of kindness to help others. Thank you. Thank you.